highly offensive, very unfair, completely untrue, very tasteless. The Crown Season 5 was finally released this week after a wave of criticism. Friends of King Charles have branded the show false, unfair and deeply wounding. The outcry has forced Netflix to add a disclaimer. In part one of our look at season five, we saw truth from lies with analysis from the male's Richard Eden. The first episode of the new series shows Charles lobbying John Major to encourage the Queen to abdicate. Dominic West's Prince of Wales is portrayed pleading with his mother to stand aside after seeing a newspaper poll that showed a support for a younger heir. In fact, Major insists such a thing never happened, launching a blistering attack on the barrel load of malicious nonsense. They've taken a, a true headline from an opinion poll at the time, which showed that there was, I think it was 47% of people were keen for the Queen to abdicate at some point in the future. And they've turned this into a whole episode where the people were urging Charles to take over and that really wasn't the case. So it's based on a false promise. And the people involved, such as Sir John Major, have just said it's highly offensive because you know he, he's a great monarchist. The last thing he would ever do is be sort of conspiring to um, force the Queen to abdicate. It's very unfair. It will appall Prince Charles without doubt. And it, it's, it's just untrue. In the second episode, Prince Philip is shown developing a close friendship with Penny Natchbull after the death of her daughter from cancer. They are seen bonding over their love of carriage driving and the two share a laugh and a joke with one another. On an intimate ride through the countryside, their hands touch on multiple occasions. Later, the Queen and Penny's relationship is depicted as being frosty. But in real life, the two women were actually extremely fond of each other and the Crown's insinuations of infidelity have enraged both families. It's certainly true that her daughter Leonora died at age five from cancer and it was, it was a true tragedy and the Queen um, and Prince Philip gave her all the support they could. Um, but this idea that it, the clear sort of innuendo implication is that the romance sort of grew between that Prince Philip almost used this tragedy to sort of um, become romantically involved with Countess Mountbatten as she now is, Penny, um, is highly offensive. Indeed, I was speaking to a friend of Penny's um, just today who was saying they're really appalled because the truth of it was that it was the Queen who was good friends with Penny and she encouraged friendship with Prince Philip. The idea of an affair, that yes, there have been lots of hints of that over the years, but that's caused a lot of anguish from the family. And also, you know, now particularly, so soon after the Queen's death and Prince Philip's is, is very tasteless. In the third episode, the royal family are shown mourning the Duchess of Windsor following her death. Shortly after, the Queen is told that there is correspondence which shows the Duke and his wife Wallace Simpson were frequently in contact with Nazis who hoped to install him as a puppet king. Edward's contacts with the Nazi regime in the run-up to World War II are well documented. In 1937, he visited Hitler at his Birkhoff retreat in Bavaria. The Nazis had a plan to kidnap Edward from Spain in 1940 and force him to take the throne after a German invasion. But despite Edward facing repeated accusations of harbouring Nazi sympathies, the real extent of his contacts have never been revealed. Unlike lots of the other stories in The Crown, it is based on truth. And it, in fact, the um, Duke of Windsor, as he then became, um, did go to visit Hitler in Germany. And he was um, a great admirer of Hitler's, like lots of the upper classes in Britain at that time, you know, lots of the appeasement that was going on. And it's true that I think he, he probably saw a way back, but it, it is based on an essential truth. In episode two, 
Prince Philip learns of Princess Diana's participation in Andrew Morton's biography. Don't rock the boat. Ever. Yet, the idea that Prince Philip knew about Diana's involvement in Andrew Morton's biography before it was published is completely fictionalised. So too is the idea that he confronted her about the book and tried to warn her off her participation. Morton has told the Daily Mail that all the correspondence with the princess was undertaken with the utmost secrecy. What's so surprising about this is that is the true story is so much more interesting than the scenario in, in The Crown, because the true story of how Andrew Morton managed to write this book with Diana's cooperation amid complete secrecy is a real shock and would have made a great episode. But instead, they've sort of invented this scenario where Prince Philip learned about it um, through Penny Mountbatten and her husband and then sort of confronted, went to see Diana and confronted her about it and she assured him that it wasn't true. So it, it's strange, it's not really clear why they've done that but um, essentially completely untrue, fictional and um, in my opinion they should have redone it with the true story. Episode 4 focuses on Princess Margaret's ongoing bitterness over the end of her relationship with Peter Townsend. Margaret calls him the love of her life and agrees to be reunited with Peter at an event in London in 1947. The pair even share a kiss. However, Margaret and Townsend's later years have been fictionalised. They did meet again in 1992, as shown in the show, but it was in private when Margaret invited him for tea rather than attend a public reunion event. Townsend was happily married to his Belgian wife and the drama's depiction of the Queen standing in the way of Margaret's love for him is also false. Well, we've seen in previous series of The Crown that romance between um, Peter Townsend and um, Princess Margaret and that was different actors at the time and that was, um, that was a very interesting episode so you can see the dramatic appeal in wanting to bring them back later and sort of make a coda to that relationship but it's untrue that although there was some sort of reunion that they tried to organise the people that had been involved on um, the Queen's tour um, Princess Margaret didn't go on that and I think, yes, she did invite him for tea or something, but he was happily married to someone else by that point. And the idea that they sort of, you know, enjoyed a kiss for old time's sake is <laughs> it's just fictional. Thanks for watching. Look out for part two of our series, Separating the Crown's Fiction from the Facts.